Hey folks, it's Paul. We have a special house guest this week. Uh, Grace's friend Alice is here visiting, and they had some stuff they wanted to talk about. So it's a uh, conversation is just going to be Grace and her friend Alice, and I will be with you next week. Take care. Okay, we on? This is it. Oh my goodness, we're on. Yep. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, this is Grace here, but uh, we don't have Paul for this podcast. We have a special guest. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice. I'm Grace's best friend. Yay! I'm not even a pot. Not even a pot. And l- yet, here she is. Um, clearly belonging to the pots cast. Alice has been visiting for the week, you know, for a conference and then for fun and then because you can. Because I can. Because you can, yeah. So we're going to try and have a conversation here and we'll talk until we're done. All right? And I think... Our topic is going to be not trusting intuition because of societal propaganda. We've been talking about it all week, off and on. It keeps coming up. It keeps coming up. It just keeps coming up. And, oh, and it's a problem. And it's a problem because, actually, intuition is better than propaganda. It is. Like, full stop. But propaganda is very powerful. Really powerful. Um, So Paul's not with us today. He's upstairs kind of... Making sure your children stay in the house, all those things. Paul was Paul was at work when we had most of these conversations this week. That's true. So, right. So, yeah. So, we wanted to not repeat them for you, but share them with you. Share them with you. Yeah. So, um, I think we'll start off with the first thing that I remember us talking about that you were, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, as many of you know, we have a house that we're trying to sell in Saginaw, Michigan. And we've gotten one offer. It's a real low ball offer. And we've had it on the market for maybe like nine months or so. Sort of on the market. Yeah, sort of on the market. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because we weren't, re- it wasn't really emptied. It wasn't really fully cleaned out. Um, long story about why we ended up putting it on the market like that. But people have seen it and kind of gone, eh. And we weren't surprised. Because because the effort to sell it was kind of eh. Because eh. Right, exactly. Right. Um, and then... We did get this one offer, and it's really low ball, and we're going to keep it on for another month or so. And I've got some real reservations about whether or not it will sell. Because of the market in Saginaw. Because, because of the market in Saginaw. It's too nice a house for the current market in Saginaw. Yes. Yeah. That, really, that's, that's what it comes down to. Um, and as you know, some of you know, listening, and Alice knows, it's a pretty amazing old house. And um, has some cosmetic issues, but really isn't... It's, it's actually really it it's a beautiful it's a large beautiful old house yeah yeah that hasn't been painted in, all that recently all that recently that's yeah that's it really, yeah. <laughs> so um so given that it occurs to me that maybe we should rent it out right mm-hmm. but everybody and his brother and his dog and mm-hmm. his uncle tells us oh you don't want to be a landlord it's the worst thing it's the worst thing that can happen you don't want to be a landlord and i was talking about ways that you can be more careful about your tenants that you can go through a real estate agent you can get references you can target people who are at a stage of life that you think they're more likely to take care of a home right and then grace said no it's not about people aren't warning me about bad tenants there's a different fear the different fear like just this panic like you know and no one said this specifically, but like they dance around with this kind of, oh my God, maybe one morning you'll wake up and you'll have a $50,000 problem. And I was like, like what, what kind like, of problem? Like, problem? like people trashed your house, and, but that, you know, that's a tenant thing. That's a tenant thing. And there are things about, you know, ways to manage that upstream. Right. And so on. Right. Um, like now that like, you know, the furnace is out, there's a plumbing problem. There's this problem. And and my reaction was, well, that's what happens when you own a house. You could wake up one morning and there's a furnace problem. There's a plumbing problem. problem. There's an electrical problem. problem. And then you have to fix it. And that would be the same whether you lived there or, or not. not. That's a liability of owning a home. Yeah. And I think people have this idea that that liability is maybe exacerbated or like doubled or something for your house 
that you don't that you don't that live you don't live in, in. don't live in and the house that you live in or something like that well that's but again it's owning two houses it's owning two houses this is the liability that goes along with owning two that, houses that happens that happens and I, I thought it was really just tell like you talked about your grandmother seventy five years oh yeah <laughs> like one so my, my my grandmother my grandmother rented out um, rooms in her home in mm-hmm. Washington D.C. for I said seventy five years it may have been as few as fifty um, oh yeah. And we know she had one really bad tenant toward the end, which is which is why she retired from this in her 90s. But she had many, many tenants over yeah. those years. Decades. For decades. And it, this is how she made her living for the last 30 years of her life, because she retired at 65 from mm-hmm. working outside the home. And then she kept this borders. home. She mm-hmm. kept borders for another 30 years mm-hmm. and um, and paid for her life that way. Yeah. So... So, I think the conclusion was that Grace doesn't actually think that this is a bad idea, but there's this pushback. And, and that she's internalized I've the I've internalized the pushback. The, the, it internalized the panic of the pushback, even though the logic of it doesn't mean doesn't, anything. Doesn't Does, mean anything, doesn't bear out. And it's impairing my ability to even think about this as an option. Right. Because... Because there's panic in the air, and then you can't, you can't weigh, can't you weigh can't weigh the options when you're panicked, level-headedly, right? And so this has crept in, and it's preventing me from even thinking about options. Maybe we which sh- might be the right option. It might be the right option. Maybe it is. I actually don't know because you can't think about it. Because I can't think about it, and apparently I'm not supposed to think about it. It shouldn't even be on the table. What kind of fool puts that on the table? is the, the backdrop against which I'm trying to think about it. Yeah. Or even consider it. So um, that, I think, set a nice groundwork for thinking about other things. Other things that have come up since then. Yeah. My other issue was um, um, I've got some blood pressure issues. Some of you also know that. And I take medication for my blood pressure. Um, one of the side effects is that I wake up really groggy, headachey, just... And you've been having nightmares. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, and I've been having nightmares most every night. Some nights, terrible nightmares, wake up in a panic and go back to, can't go back to sleep. Some nights, I have a nightmare, go back to sleep, maybe remember it or not. But, you know, fair, fair amount of the time, I wake up and can't get back to sleep. And then when I do wake up, I have a terrible headache um, such that I really can't active in the day unless I take some Tylenol or something to get rid of the headache or just wait until it passes. Um, th- this is really cramping my style. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you might imagine. And we were pointing out, you know, people, people don't seem to appreciate how terrible nightmares are. But if you've had one in the last month, it probably made an impression on you. And it, it's, yeah. it's, it's really the sensation that somebody's trying to kill you. Exactly. And, it, and this is what I really appreciate that you said. You know, if the side effect of your medication was that someone would try to kill you every night. Even if they, even if they couldn't. They couldn't. People would take that very seriously. They would take that very seriously. Even if they couldn't kill you, but that you'd be in the position of facing that down every night. And, and as Grace pointed out, her nervous system at the, in the moment does, can't tell the difference. Can't tell the difference. Right. In the moment of the dream. Can't tell the difference. So, um, so yeah, I'm trying to, I, I really have a lot of incentive to avoid that side effect. That side effect. Um, and I've had a hard time noticing what makes, if there's, if there's something that triggers it more or less or whatnot, right? But one thing I have noticed and kept pushing to the back burner is that um, every time I have a stiff drink, I have like a shot of scotch before I go to bed. I sleep comfortably without a nightmare. And I wake up headache free. <laughs> and as we pointed out, that's not as bad for, for your liver mm-hmm. as taking time at all. Every, you know, every time, every day. If I take it every day, or even like four times a week. A shot of hard liquor every night is not as bad for your liver as taking Tylenol four to six times a week. I think a lot of people don't. This is where we realize the research on that. I just want to just back up. I think a lot of people don't realize that Tylenol actually does a fair amount of damage to your liver. That, on the one hand, you should not be terrified of taking Tylenol for an occasional headache. Mm-hmm. 
or um, I don't think it's a good idea to use a fever reducer. But if for some reason you want to reduce your fever, Tylenol does that too. Um, we can talk separately about why you shouldn't reduce your fever. But that aside, um, while it's an occasional use thing that y- you really shouldn't worry about, if you're t- unless you already have liver problems, unless you already have, yes, if you already have liver problems, your doctor's probably already talked to you about acetaminophen and its dangers. If you have liver problems, but if you don't have liver problems. You will have liver problems if you take it every day. If you make it a consistent part of your, basically a consistent part of your diet, that you're consuming acetaminophen on a regular basis, it's going to harm your liver. And you probably want to avoid or find some way to solve whatever problem is prompting. It's causing the pain. It's causing the pain and prompting you to take this. and, And this, I think a lot more people have heard, one dose of alcohol a day seems to have zero ill effect on health. Right, like when you get up to three, then you're then starting, you're really starting. To, then you're starting to have problems. Right, but a single a single dose of alcohol when you're not going to be driving or operating machinery seems it, like it might even be completely risk free. Yeah. Certainly, extremely low risk. Extremely even, low risk, even yeah. if it's every day. Even if it's every day. And I think I think people have heard that because it was kind of it's like good news, right? Right, right. And people reported it as good news. And don't realize that they've heard the beer and wine statistic, but that also includes um, what people call hard liquor, you know, distilled spirits. And it's a shot. We, were, we weren't sure. Is that one and a half ounces or two ounces? But it's two ounces or less, I think, is probably, probably in the right space. Probably okay. Right. So here I am in need of relief from my headaches, panicked nightmares, and night terror. Really, night terrors. And... I'm not taking... An inability to get up in the morning. An in, oh, an inability to get up in the morning. I'm just like dragging. Um, I have medicine in my house to treat this that is actually safer for my liver than Tylenol. And I'm not taking it because I've internalized so much of the... Well, also, fear of liver damage from alcohol. And really just shame but also about... stigma. Stigma. About taking alcohol. Oh my goodness, your life is going to fall apart. And it's not that nobody's life falls apart from their alcohol oh, use. Yes. That does happen. It happens. But that's not what's happening that's, here. That's not what's happening here. And I I think the data has shown that people's lives don't fall apart from taking a shot once a day. Right. But somehow that that can't be medicine. That can't be medicine. That's it's dangerous. Booze. It's booze. It's dangerous. When there's a standard joke about how your scotch or whatever it is is medicinal. And people laugh about that. And joke about that, whereas historically... But in this case, it is medicinal. In this case, it is medicinal. And historically, it has been used medicinally. And that's, frankly, why a lot of people... That's where the joke came from. Yeah, that's where the joke came from. Um, that, oh, it's about medicine. But, you know, we've been thinking about other things Grace can do to get off this medicine, and they're all a good idea anyway, like taking turmeric and cinnamon Cinnamon. and black pepper and eating celery every day, right? Yeah. these are all, all good things. even lower risk than a shot of whiskey. Right. But until she gets there, there's no reason for her to have another nightmare right. when, when she's got this, this, this cheap, in widely house. available, effective medicine right in, in her house. In my house. And yet. And yet. Here I am, not thinking about the option, and really discarding the option before I consider it. Because of social because propaganda. Because of social propaganda and panic. And panic. So these things, um, probably this probably wasn't going to kill me or harm anybody in my family, likely, right? I mean, maybe, you know, my sluggishness in the morning could have harmed my children or any number of things, right? It Things could happen. But, you know, the stakes were moderate. 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 But how many things are we unafraid to examine? Uh, you know, afraid afraid to, exa- to examine. Because of social panic and social propaganda about how you can't consider the option. That's just beyond the pale. You can't even consider it or think about it. Don't even do it. And I like to think of myself as someone who's not even open-minded, but just read, really ready to think about things. A critical thinker. And, and really, yeah, think critically and think about things that, you know, other people aren't willing to think about. And right? yet. And yet here and I yet, am. And yet here you are stuck on both those issues. Stuck on both those issues. This 
the last one I have, I have recorded or noted down for us to talk about was um, nicotine is medicine. Oh, yeah. So in my life, um, I have a family member who has chronic anxiety. And she, um, the medicine that is most effective for her is stigmatized by doctors. So she's had a hard, she didn't have access to it at all for four years. And mm-hmm. recently, uh, this spring, was given a dose that's a little low for her. And so mm-hmm. she has much less anxiety than she's used to, but still some. Mm-hmm. And she had this reaction of, wow, I'm a person again, I can do things. But she can't quite do the things she thinks of. You know, she, right. Partly because she's thinking of so many things, because four years of not doing anything is a long time. Mm-hmm. It's a long list backed up. It's a long backed up list. And partly because her medicine was not quite enough for her to be 100% functional. Mm-hmm. And... Um, for a couple of weeks of this, um, she was just incredibly frustrated all the time and actually kind of unbearable to be around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then one day she said, you know, I think cigarettes would help because 10 years ago she was a smoke, she quit smoking Mm -hmm. and she got cigarettes and was a a new person. Was bearable company again. Was bearable company again. And, um started feeling good about her life Mm -hmm. and like it took me a very long time to imagine you know she told me before oh cigarettes are medicine they work on depression they do this they do that that. right yeah no it's cigarettes are they murder people they kill people they kill people it's it excuse people say they're medicine because they're already addicted but this was a person who was Was not not at that moment addicted right and clearly, it's it's the psychiatric treatment that that works for her. Mm-hmm. And now she's she switched to the patch. And again, I'm even though it's not it's killing not her, killing her with the smoke, with the lungs. smoke in her lungs. I still have this anxiety. Like, but wait, you're putting nicotine yeah. in your system. It's it's nicotine. It's nicotine. It's addictive. It's all these things. Even though it makes her life better, she can get it. She has a prescription for it. If for some reason her prescription runs out, there's a substitute that she can get at the corner store. store. It's it's actually much safer in all those ways than other psychiatric drugs. Uh, other drugs right. And yet. But but I lead with panic. You lead with the panic. So right. so So even though I've seen with my own eyes this person transformed. And, 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 you know, yes, there's a stereotype of, oh, somebody has nicotine withdrawal and they're very cranky and blah, blah, blah until they get their cigarette. Right. This was she hadn't control. smoked in years. In years. Right. And was transformed by, by access to the drug. Yeah. And, and I, again, it yeah. was the right... And, and much like Grace's nightmares, this is not a symptom that's going to physically injure somebody right no in her case okay. i can imagine that kind of frustration leading to violence in a different personality right but it was ruining her life and everyone around her right uh, you don't need to live like that and she didn't need to live like that and 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 she's actually found a solution um at least in the near term in the near term that's you know get you that's through. kind of miraculous kind of miraculous. and can get you over the hump and can get her over the hump Right. Right. Uh, until she figures out how to manage her her goals in this in this new state. In this new state. And as you like find a a balance point with medication. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and so when I think about this and especially when you pointed out that there was this thread in our conversations this week, right? Mm-hmm. Like my brain started swirling. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, it's everywhere. Oh it's my everywhere. god! And it is. It is. And the thing, I think I was mentioning and ta- um, bringing up just before we got on was about parenting and how you will. Um, I don't that much anymore. I've kind of moved into a space where I'm. Uh, I don't know. More confident. Secure. More secure. Yeah, secure. Not even confident. Just secure. Right. Um. But I've certainly done it in the past, may well do it again, and I've seen people do it over and over again. Their child is misbehaving in public, 
Mm-hmm. And they have some serious empathy for like just how tough it is and what they're going through. And they're ready to respond with empathy. And then they realize that someone's watching. Someone's watching. And they will think less of me if I empathize with my child. And that mm. grips them mm-hmm. and changes their behavior. I, I've seen it in people's faces. I felt it in my own body. Like, <gasps> what's this person going to think if I comfort my child instead of scold instead or punish? Of scolding. Scolding mm-hmm. or punishing, right? I mean, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to say? What's going to happen? And panic is the word. Mm. Like, you're just like panic, 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 panic. Oh, no. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Right. <laughs> and invariably, you end up meeting the social expectation rather than thinking. <laughs> or, or doing what's going to be effective. Or doing what's going to be effective. Or even just doing what you feel like you ought to do. Which may or may not be effective, may or not mm-hmm. be any of these other things. But it's your, it's yours. It's, it's your yours. intuition. You have this intuition about what to do next, and you just reject it in this panic about, oh gosh, I don't want to be also scorned by the public. And to some extent, it's a very valid fear because some people are really brazen and will really confront you judgmental. and judgmental and will make much more of a scene than conventional behavior would have had. Right? Would have elicited. Would have elicited, right? Um, but that's not, that's not always true. It's rarely true. It's rarely mm-hmm. true. I mean, that person is pretty brazen. You don't find them everywhere. It, so it's mostly the voice in your head. It's mostly the voice in your head who's saying all these things to you about how you... Because maybe these other people don't even notice you. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right? Right? A lot of times, you know... Especially yeah. if you are effective with your child. If you are effective, they don't it's even It's all going to be done. Right. It's all going to be done. They don't even notice. It hasn't gotten that big yet when it might feel loud or big to you, etc. Or like a meltdown. It's like, yeah, we had a couple of meltdowns at dinner tonight. Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. I was there. Nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. Right. But we had a couple of meltdowns at dinner. (laughs) And I I think another thing with children is you often want to ignore their meltdowns and that you really do get a lot of judgment for. Yes. Like what's wrong with you that you can't, that you don't have an off switch. You you don't have an off switch. You can just fix this now. Whereas actually most kinds of tantrums, the most effective thing to do is literally nothing. Literally nothing. And that just, does yeah. leave that particular tantrum long. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it goes on. It and goes on and on. Yep. And some children have real staying power, you know? Some of Grace's children. Some of my children have some serious staying power. They come by honestly. So <laughs> the um so that that can be awkward in public and it can be uncomfortable in public. And um most of those people aren't ready to read the research on the subject. Especially or, in the moment. Especially in the moment. Um, but that is what it is. And it's the right thing to do. And you really have to be prepared for the one person you'll meet every now and again who wants to come and make a thing out of it. And um, if the voice and that's is, a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And when the voices in your head are also talking... It's hard to hear your intuition. It's hard to hear your intuition. Or the research you remember reading, or even the response you memorized to have in the situation when you're out. Or to, or as Grace keeps saying, it's really hard to think it through. To think it through. And just think it through rationally. Like, okay, if I do this, this, and then this, and then this, and make a decision just by thinking about it. Because not only the people outside, either imaginary or for real, their voices in your head, social propaganda, talking to you about what you should do. Oh, this actually brings me back. Oh, my goodness. And this is alcohol again. I was talking to a friend of mine that's uh, coming to visit. And she's like, should I bring something? Do you want to do you want some wine? Do you guys drink or whatnot? Yeah. And she's like, I know Catholics drink, and but some people are some Protestants don't drink and just wanted to ask. I said, actually, you know, I know a fair number of Catholics, you know, they're not recovering alcoholics and they don't drink and they don't drink because they were raised around Protestants Mm -hmm. and they feel the social stigma of that 
today, now in their own lives, in their own homes, they still they still feel have that, that internalized. Stigma. It's internalized. And what I said to her, and actually this is something I this is the thing I've been thinking about a lot, like the last year and a half. I've been thinking about this so much. And of course, it's something that I've been thinking about for years, but really it's intensified. That your environment catechizes you, it teaches you, it molds you. And I think we, you know, we know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know that. Mm -hmm. But we kind of pretend that we don't. You know what I mean? I think I know what you mean. (laughs) Yeah, like, so we we know that, but I'm sure it won't be a problem. (laughs) Sorry, it's okay. Excuse the terrible mic adjusting noise. I'm sitting up straighter than I expected to. But yeah, the adjustment had to happen. But it had to happen. (laughs) Um. So you think, oh, yeah, that's important. That's important. But I'm sure it won't hurt a little bit if I just pile these boxes in this corner. Right? Mm -hmm. And then it changes everything about your day-to-day life. I'm thinking about my boxes from my pantry, right? At the moment. That's what I'm thinking about at the moment. But all these things, we're like, oh, yes, I know the environment matters. I know it. That I'm stuck with. I'm stuck with it. Something from my childhood. Right. Stuck with something from my childhood. Stuck with these ideas. But you don't realize all the things that you've internalized that were like the wallpaper, you know, mm-hmm. these uh, social expectations and this social propaganda that was effectively wallpaper in your surroundings. Yeah, it's just there. It's just there. No one sat you down and had you memorize it and give you a test. Mm-hmm. But it's all back there waiting. Waiting to blow up. Waiting to blow up. Waiting to do its thing. Terrifying you. Waiting, waiting to panic moment. you. Panic you. Yep. At the wrong moment. And so I think... Um, is there a solution? I I think part of the solution is thinking a lot. I think part of the solution is thinking a lot. And I think, I mean, what I keep wanting to do in these circumstances is say, is there anything to the social propaganda? Is there something we're missing? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. And but yeah. if there's not, to try to de-escalate emotionally it's kind of how I want to say it, is yeah, to be like, okay, yeah. I see that panic. Do I, I hear that it? panic. Well, not just do I have to respond to it, but actually, can I empathize with it? Can I empathize with that panic? Because that panic is also a, a, a two-year-old having a tantrum. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And uh, just kind of make space for the fear to be fear. To be fear. And maybe to loosen up a little and not control your decisions. Yeah. And as pithy, or not not pithy, as uh, cliche as it sounds, you know, a deep breath and counting to 10 is so useful. It's helpful. It's it's really helpful. And you might even feel silly doing it, right? The thing that I found hardest is giving myself a timeout. That, Mm. you know, I... A while back, actually, I stopped giving the children timeouts, right? Yeah. But I started giving my... I started giving myself timeouts, Mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think I did, I do give the advice that you know, sometimes you need to walk away. I give that advice. To you, to your kids. To my children. Yeah, sure. That, you know, you're in this situation and it's really getting rough. I think it's time for you to walk away for a few minutes or walk away altogether or just figure out something to do, but not, this isn't a good spot for you to do it in. Uh, but for myself, I give myself timeouts a couple times a day, every day. Sure. Because I'm getting too... Attached. Attached. In, uh, just too attached and engaged in whatever's happening and the way I take the time out like I get myself in the space where I can like physically move and walk away and detach myself is take a deep breath and count to 10 mm-hmm. and I felt mm-hmm. ridiculous the first 50 times mm-hmm. just ludicrous like seriously I'm going to do this yes but first you, you take a deep breath count to 10 and then you walk away then I walk away so that's how you stop action in the um, in the moment attached loop in the attached loop I'm just here and I can like see myself like a little movie reeling out like Mm -hmm. are you about to do that oh my god you're gonna do that (laughs) (laughs) and like the first time or maybe the second time i'm like shouting at myself what are you even doing Mm -hmm. i say to myself take a deep breath Mm. count to 10 and by the time i get to 10 i can then say please excuse me or just walk away Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at this point, my children know that I just need to walk away and just let me leave gracefully. Sure, (laughs) they're generous that way. Um, So I don't need to say anything. I just walk, walk away. And um, only one of them really is like, "Where Where are you going? going? 
Yeah. Come back here and have this fight now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But I, th- I think, I think, really, the first step is recognizing that there's a voice of panic in your head. There's a voice of panic in your head. And then, I do think yeah. it's worth checking if there's something real there because because maybe so- your intuition is panicking. Soci- well, because societal messages come from somewhere. Right. They're not just. They're not just crazy. They're it's not, not just, just crazy. Off the off the wall. And if you can figure out what they're about, maybe you want to use it. Maybe you don't. Once you figure out what they're about. Once you figure out, yeah. But I think also to recognize the emotional quality of the panic. Hmm. And treat it separately from the decision making. Right. The panic is actually not part of the decision. Right. It's it, something else. It's something else. Oh, gosh. The um, thing you said about societal expectations and societal expectations coming from somewhere. And yeah, I don't know if this is a counterexample, but it reminded me of something we talked about years ago about surgery. Remember talking about surgery? I remember talking about surgery. I remember you saying surgeons like to do surgery is this the conversation we made oh that was one no this isn't it's not that one surgeons like to do surgery it's a little bit creepy actually but um the other one was there's this i want to call it a meme because it's almost like a meme like we see on the internet now yep where all those medieval people were so backward Mm -hmm. they wouldn't let people study anatomy yeah and they didn't want surgery and they didn't want like all these wonderful advancements of medicine because they were so backward. Yeah. And I think our conversation was, I think I, I, I was either having a, something was going on. Like I was having mm-hmm. some kind of medical procedure. Yep. I don't think it was my call, but it was even before that. Anyway, it occurred to me, yeah, actually, you know, cutting people open is pretty extreme. It's pretty dangerous. It's, it's dangerous pretty extreme. extreme. It's something you should be afraid of. You should be afraid of that. It's not weird or backwards to be afraid of someone cutting you open. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it's. But again, I th- I think I don't think it is a counterexample. I think it's kind of the an inverse. An that, inverse. That nowadays everybody thinks surgery is the answer to everything, and surgery is always okay. It's always okay. It's fine. It's, and and it's, it's always it's just surgery. And isn't it wonderful that we can blah 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 oh, surgery? Right. It, you know. Schedule a C-section so you don't have to miss work. Um, Wouldn't that be great? You can have it on carpal, Friday. Get carpal tunnel surgery at 96. That happened to my grandmother. Oh, my God. Um, that would be great, right? <laughs> and it's true that after she had her debilitating stroke, she could hold a paintbrush. Mm-hmm. But she couldn't see what she was painting, so it was really quite the trade-off. Right. Um. And And so there's... I think this is a case where the, the societal wisdom just seems crazy to me so so i don't i don't feel like i've internalized it yeah yeah i i i think i inter what is it i'd internalized it enough to know it was it was a thing to know it was there right i've internalized the i'm yes i'm I'm aware internalized the the frame right i've internalized that frame i i know that frame Mm -hmm. but as soon as i like gave it any kind of any kind of examination and i was like that's not weird of course you should be afraid of getting cut open it's of also course. very interesting that apparently hunter gatherers have surgery. It's like the oldest form of medicine because hunter gatherers have sharp, sharp tools. tools. I mean, I don't know if it's the oldest. Herbalism is obviously probably the oldest. Probably the oldest, but but um, yeah, prehistoric people had surgery. Yeah, you, you don't actually need um the this the post enlightenment scientific method Good. for surgery. For surgery. It, it, again, this is another gift of the enlightenment that wasn't actually a gift of the Enlightenment. Yep. Yeah. So um, that's an ongoing thing that Paul and I have is the Enlightenment. We're going to do an Enlightenment podcast because... You, know, you disagree? I disagree, right? You, you disagree with each other. You and Paul disagree. Oh, yeah, Paul and I disagree. Sure. Um, and this is funny. You and I actually disagree about very few things. Like occasionally we come out on different policy places, right? Mm-hmm. But <laughs> we have a different policy solution. But to agree the same about problem. It, to the same problem. And I agree about the problem. Mm-hmm. Right, but yeah, generally true. Generally true. Um, oh, what was the? Oh, yes. So this idea of surgery and modern notion. Oh, come on. Is again stifles your ability to make a good decision. To make a good decision. 
like, you know, maybe that's not a good decision. And I'd like to think about it. So I don't know. Just, and, yeah. and it was used in a panic way against you for your gallbladder surgery. It was totally used in a panic way against me. I, I don't know if, I assume your listeners don't know the story. Oh, I, I don't think all, all of them know. A couple of them are familiar, I, I think. But yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. So Grace um, had gallstones after her second pregnancy. And mm-hmm. for those of you who don't know, when you're pregnant, it's not safe to eat cholesterol because you will get gallstones. Right. We don't know why that's not in every pregnancy book and everywhere. Everywhere. And that's not something obstetricians tell you in advance. Apparently, all obstetricians know. No. And are completely unsurprised when it happens yes. after the fact. After the fact. So, Grace. Eight uh, eggs every day for well, nine months. It, right. And then got my and gallstones. Then, then got gallstones. And Grace, as you probably know, is very food conscious. And so yes. she was able to manage her gall, gallstones, gallstones yeah. with diet mm-hmm. until <laughs> um, until we did a, uh, Grace and I and other people did a rolling fast in solidarity with some fasting prisoners. Yep. And Grace fasted two or three times in a month. And mm-hmm. the last time she did it, she ate a big omelet the day before. Before my fast. Before right. her fast. And mm-hmm. then she got... Really bad gallstones. Again. Horrible attack. Horrible gallstones. First, I was like seven or eight years. Yeah. Seven or eight years later. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. After managing with diet for seven or eight years. And having two or three children in between. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so not just seven or eight years, but seven or eight years and... Several pregnancies. Several pregnancies. Right. So, um, So Grace was being pressured to have her gallbladder removed, and she really... Didn't want to. Didn't want to. I was using it, you know. And yeah, so I was heavily. I ended up having it removed under pressure. Under, I would say coercion. Coer- absolutely. They coercion, said yeah. she said, "Let me think about it. You can put me on the schedule for Monday, and I will think about it over the weekend." And they wheeled her in on Friday. Yes. Like basically, as I'm thinking about it, and I don't know. And, oh, and this was the other piece of it. The, I there were like there was like three things. There was a clear decision to be made. And there were several options. Option one, because they'd already cleared the obstruction. That was the emergency room visit. Mm-hmm. And like the emergent problem was I have a gallbladder obstruction. It's I'm jaundiced. I've got to get this stone moved and resolve that presenting problem. Secondary to that is removing the gallbladder so I don't get gallstones again. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. But once the obstruction has been moved. It's no longer an emergency. It's no longer an emergency. I could choose to manage the diet again. I could have it removed. And if I have it removed, I could have an open surgery or I can have laparoscopic surgery. Right? That's right. And you had decided to have an open surgery, but they gave you a laparoscopic surgery. Bam. And and yeah. was there any conversation about that or they just went no, in and did it? They just went, they just went in and did that. And, and she almost died. And then I almost Twice. died. Twice, yeah. So, um, it's a but strong... They, they, they yeah. got they, they didn't literally wheel her in while she was saying no. They wheeled her in while she was saying... Let me think about let it. Let me think about it. And they were like... Okay. They, were, they said okay, and then they wheeled you in? Yeah. Okay. Because what I remember was there was also an element of panic. They were trying to make it seem like it was still an emergency. That was true, too. That was true, too. They, they were trying to make it seem like it was still an emergency. Like, they... There's this thing that happens in the hospital where you are like, hold on a minute, let me think about X, Y, Z. And they say, okay, and keep going. That's actually a thing they do. I'm telling you, they're just like cops. I, yeah. I, I'm not actually resistant to that frame. <laughs> it's just so painful, you know? <laughs> like so many of my family members are physicians, you know? I, I'm not. Sh- I, I don't know as much about physicians, but I've had a lot of experiences with nurses. With nurses acting yeah. like exactly like, like cops. Like cops. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I've I've got a few nurses in my you know extended family as well. Um. Yeah. It's just it's painful. So this um, that was just that was so, a real so shit panic, show. Yeah. So panic, that's the word. 
It was yeah. a shit show. Yeah, it was really horrible. And she was not, in the long run, not able to sue. And actually, circling back to the blood pressure, mm-hmm. this is when Grace's high blood pressure began. Began. This was, was like the event. Was not, it was not the surgery and all the complications of the surgery. It was the anger. Oh, yeah. I was angry for like a year. Oh, yes. Like and, just, you know, she got a lawyer. Her blood pressure went way down. Way down. It's like, okay, we're going to sue. This is going to be good. Oh, it's sliding down on you. I think it's sliding down. I oh. didn't realize that. Let me see if I can tighten yeah, something. Yeah, do an adjustment thing. And I think that little knob thing, is that holding? It's holding for now. Okay. Oh, gosh, see, yeah. I, I thought it was just... I thought it was just that Paul had said it for me to slouch, which I thought I was going to, and then I didn't, but it's actually sliding, sliding. after I adjust it. Oops. The, um, oh, yeah, so now I got an attorney, blood pressure went way down. It was, yeah, I was, in, I was really feeling good then. Um, but the, this is what's really horrible, right? So the laparoscopic surgery is so prone to injury that um, you generally can't sue because, what do they say, the standard is that in the best of hands, this problem could have happened in the very best of hands so in other words we talked you into something that we knew was gonna hurt you you. didn't you know didn't you know oh sorry sorry about that of the the i think the most vindicating moment though for me i was really deeply vindicated um because you know you think to at least i think to myself you know maybe these people can't just do this kind of thing maybe i misunderstood something Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe this isn't really what happened. Maybe this isn't really what happened. It, maybe I it, misunderstood maybe something I'm, or missed something. I missed something. I ran into the surgeon at the grocery store, and he ran away from you. He ran away from me, terrified at the sight of me. Turned around and ran. Like, did literally. you have, did you ever declare a lawsuit? I, I remember you like talk to a lawyer but ended up not suing did the, we did, did you notify all. the hospital not at all no, so the all. doctor just knows what he did he knows and what was he afraid did. of you and was afraid of me when he saw me in public again because he knows exactly what he did and so that was actually i won't say it's as vindicating as having one in court but um it put to rest any fears i had that maybe i don't know maybe right, just, that, that maybe you were imagining it blowing out of proportion, proportion misunderstanding all those things right no, no, no. He knows. And was, you know, afraid to like be next to me at the grocery store, not talk to me, not stand next to me in line, but like he might walk by me at the grocery store. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, you know, there's all these other things we can get into. But again, there's this frame about making the decision that, oh gosh, you know, no one does the open surgery anymore. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, no one treats that with oh, yeah. diet. Be- because the the open surgery is much less likely to hurt you, but it has a much longer recovery time. So that's why everybody's like, laparoscopic surgery, it's so amazing. Yay! Oh, yay! You can get back be- to work. Because, well, first there's the gee whiz factor. Like, G-whiz. wow, somebody invented that. That's such a great gimmick. But more than, but not more than that. But also, mm-hmm. you recover much more quickly if you recover. If you recover, and it's there was fast. this idea that Grace had several babies at Two home. Babies at home. Pippin was like new. He wasn't even he six was like months. Four months or something. Yeah, I think was Pippin very, was four months. Yeah. Um, about mm-hmm. and uh, and having a wound in your abdomen when you have a lot of babies at home is very impractical. It's impractical. It really was going to be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal. It, it, so I, I don't mean to downplay that, or the reality of the big deal of a large abdominal incision, you know, like a C-section. But she had those complications Agents. that they talk about. Yeah, that exists. And and almost died twice in one week. Almost died twice in one week. And it, oh, and, and they also made it. An extra mistake. An extra mistake. Yeah, well, we'll save that for another podcast, the extra mistake, because that is just unbelievable. Um, but yeah. But but yes, they, they, they made it out to, they made it so that there isn't a choice. But so that there isn't a choice, when there are lots of choices. I, I there actually, are lots I have choices. a friend who, um, who has arthritis, mm-hmm. uh, congenital heart arthritis, so he's had it since he was a k- kid or a teenager or something, mm-hmm. and he took medicine for it. 
And when they started inventing the Vioxx type stuff, right. doctors kept pushing him toward, don't you want to take this instead? Don't you want to take, take this, this instead? instead? And he didn't. <gasps> no, don't. And um, I'm fairly sure that his effective, mm-hmm. less dangerous medication is off the market now. Oh, my God. Now, yeah. the... This particular friend of mine is very stoic. He just quit his medication and is living with pain. And like it took him about six months to get used to the pain. And now he just has pain. Now he just has pain. Most people can't do that. Most people, yeah. Most people can't do that. They need the medication. But, but right? this, this pressure that you need to do the cutesy thing. The cutesy thing, come on. Even when it's for your health. Right. We can't actually just think it through and actually evaluate And make the choices. decision that's right for you. Right. Right. Well, and, and the this is actually the best part, right? Or the funniest or the most ironic part. My recovery from nearly dying took as long as oh, the recovery. As, as the recovery from the big... Open, from open surgery. open surgery. I could not carry my children for like eight to 12 weeks. And eight, eight weeks is how long it's supposed to take with the, with the full... Open surgery. Full open surgery. Right. Um, so, yay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> After all was said and done, uh, yeah. So that's that's actually a big example. <laughs> it is a big example. It's a big example. So yeah. I think I think the moral of the story is panic evolved for a reason. Mm-hmm. Oh, don't abuse it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Panic evolved for a reason. You can usually recognize when it doesn't belong. Yeah. Yeah. It's not actually mysterious. You can see it. You can recognize it. And, and it's hard when there's social pressure to mm-hmm. say, wait a second, I think you're panicking me. And I think, actually, I don't have to panic here. Yeah. Oh, I do have one other tip. I have one other mm. tip that I've worked on um, with all of my children and myself. And I think it's very effective. Um, I encourage them... To be countercultural on purpose in really small ways. Mm. Because social pressure is really hard. And when it's time for you to stand against social pressure and it counts, you, you need to have had that practice. You need to have the practice. You need to have had the practice. So, yeah, I'm going to wear my hair a little funny. Yeah, I'm going to do this, whatever, I mean, really innocuous thing. I, it's interesting because for um, for what I'm noticing is that Grace and I are going to have a weak spot when it comes to social pressure that has a moral side to it. Oh, yeah. Which is why, right, we're all caught up on alcohol can't be medicine. Can nicotine medicine. can't be, be medicine. medicine. Because that's our weak spot. We... we um, you know, there's a bumper sticker that says, well-behaved women don't make history. history. And I often say, well, Grace and I are the, 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 radical, exception. the yeah. exception to that. Right. Um, so it's it's useful also to notice where where that's hardest for you. Where it's hardest for you. Yeah. And exercise that muscle. So that when it's time, you'll be strong. Yeah. Oh, is that is that this, is that the story? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That was sad and beautiful and good. I'm glad we had this conversation. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, guys. Thanks, Alice.